Okay. Yeah, don't say any bad words because we're recording. <laughs> I better shut up. Real hard. You good? Yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking publicly. I don't. Just a couple of people still uh, waiting for the bathroom. Yeah. Uh, nobody even mentioned the four Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you that. Yeah, okay. You just didn't think I said it. I guess it's just those two guys in the old fire that were in Burlington. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, you were going to put it in Burlington. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, last week. Yeah, my fault. I'm better. Some of the other Yeah, yeah. They can zoom in if they're made it back to the office. Oh, um, yeah, you have the zoom one? Yes. I, I have to interrupt the zoom to send you the zoom one. Okay. Uh, let's, how about I just uh, invite you? Yeah, but my round table, you know. Yeah, for the, if you're going to record it, that would be cool. Uh, so we can access to it. It is going to be recorded. For some reason, I'm not able to open it. You mean the security is in there? Yeah, the other people. I can get it for you. Can you? Yeah. I Thanks. Said, I said that it's in the six my outbox. Why don't you do that while I uh, introduce Samantha? And uh, I think most of you have met Samantha. Her detailed bio is in the uh, blue. Uh, folder, so I, I won't go through it in the interest of time. I will tell you, she's a wicked smart lawyer. Um, many of you have heard my kimono story. She was involved in that uh, oh, peripherally, and uh, so I, I knew how good she was at that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I called her actually as a result of Carlos asking a question about garden leave. And I'd never heard of it before, and I didn't know anything about it. So I called Samantha. I actually called Lisa Yerusi, who you all know, who worked with me at uh, at that kimono place. And that's what it's become. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and she reminded me of uh, of Samantha's uh, uh, wisdom in these areas. So I called her up about the garden leave thing, and she said, "Yes, but what about misclassification? What about?" other um, uh, jurisdictions and so on. And I, well, I never thought of that. Well, we're going to learn about that today. So take it away, Samantha. And, um, I think if, if they have questions, they can ask. Oh, yeah. I like being interrupted. I'm but, totally happy being interrupted. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And if uh, I forgot to bring a sign-in sheet, my my bad. Um, so if you give me your business card or you put your email address there, we'll put you on the newsletter list so you can find out when they change the next thing. Um, also in your packet is um, our latest newsletter, which was on the FTC non compete, which we'll talk about also. Um, but that way, and if you want the slides, um, I might. If you sign up, I'll just send everyone the slides. That's probably easier, right? Don't need to tell me. Okay, so you're gonna have to see me. Fortunately, walking back and forth from my own seats here. So it works. Okay, that's good. We've already started off great. There we go. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about working from home, you know, the fabulous new virtual workplace that we're all in, um, the perils of misclassification. How many of you have heard that the SJC did this great new decision where like everyone is liable for trouble damages the moment they make a mistake? So we're going to talk about that. Great uh, decision for plaintiff's lawyers. They're thrilled. Um, leave requests, FMLA, PFML, PFML, the state law in Massachusetts, accommodations, non-compete changes, documentation, feedback, all this fun stuff. I talk super, super fast. 
Good and I'm going to take, and I'm going to talk incredibly fast. Um, and if you say to me, you're talking too fast, go ahead. But it's the only way I can get through everything as fast as possible um, and get you home, you know, before midnight. Um, but if you interrupt me, again, just you can raise your hand if it's more comfortable or you can just talk. I don't care. So over, we all have virtual employees now. We all work from home sometimes. Everybody's everywhere, right? They're all in their pajamas working from home. You don't know what they're doing. We're going to talk about managing them and sort of the legal implications of that. So I have a question. Yeah. Are, you, are you recording on your computer too, just to make sure we have your role in your audio? Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, Policies well, and other documentation, compliance issues, and best practices. Okay. So that virtual workplace, work with the, so when you have these people in these other states, right? If your employee suddenly pops up in North Carolina, you can't find a good person in, in Massachusetts, you grab somebody, uh, you know, in California, all that. You have to be very carefully that you're hiring people legally in those states, right? There's paperwork that goes with this. Your documentation may not, may have to be adjusted, your regular contracts. So if you're using a non-compete or you're using uh, an offer letter, you want to have that checked to make sure that there isn't some weird thing in the states, right? And be particularly careful when you're looking at states like, you can guess which states I'm going to say, right? California, California New York, so New Jersey, Colorado is becoming so good at this. They are really driving us all crazy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, you know, which is Washington State is huge right now. Yeah. They just, they are off the charts. We're waiting for Michigan to become the next one because they just flipped their legislature. So it's clear that when... Democrats are in control, you're going to get a lot more laws. So you can actually just look at a map and see where Biden won, where Trump won, and kind of get a feel of what's going to be going on in the state. Um, so like I said, recognize there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all employment form. Advertisements. You mentioned Colorado. Colorado, New York City have done this fabulous thing. California jumps on the bandwagon, and we're not going to cover this today. I spent a whole, I just did a whole talk on this yesterday. Salary transparency laws are the newest thing. When you are advertising for virtual people, that ad has to be compliant with basically New York City's law, no matter what. So you're going to default to the city of New York if that person could be in New York. Or if you have one person in Colorado and that person could be in Colorado, you are going to be under that law as well. It basically means you have to give a salary range, low, high, best guess of what you would be paying this person and some other language. Uh -huh. What if you don't purposely recruit in those states? So if we just put it on our website and say, hey, we need a... Or indeed, yes. We just need somebody. Virtual. Yep. And we don't say don't say anything. anything about location. We have to put the transparency yes. stuff on there. Yes. And when Colorado, because Colorado was first, when they started doing this, we thought, what if we just say, no one in Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Colorado was like, please don't do that. But more importantly, every other state's doing it, and there's there's a bill in Massachusetts. It's going to hit us yeah. real soon. But, yeah. So when you say Colorado, I said please don't do that. But they don't can stop you from saying, hey, I'm not, so I don't want to hire anyone from the state because it's too complicated. Right. So you can definitely do that, like in terms of like I don't want to hire anyone in California because I'd have to register to pay taxes in California, and I don't want to do that. It's more if, if your ad is going out there and you have a person in Colorado, right. but you say I don't because. Colorado's law only applies if you have one person in their state. If you have no one in their state, they don't care about you. New York City, however, does care about you. Now, ask me if I really care what New York City thinks about me. No, and the harm is going to be very slight for these salary transparency violations, right? We think that most of them are going to be trolls. People, and there, these do exist, and I've had clients hit by them a lot, people who go around the internet looking for problematic ads and bring lawsuits. We can settle those for very little money usually, so they're not really my big problem. Where we think salary transparency is going to be problematic is pay equity. So it's your current employees. You're going to put something on the web to comply with the state law and say, this is what I pay for this position. And your employee is going to come to you and say, why am I on the low range of this? I've been here five years. This isn't right. And so that's it. Or you're just going to say, why is this person making more than me? I should get the same thing. And so we do think it's going to be sort of your current employees looking at that. Um, and part of these statutes, the ones we don't talk about as much, is the ones that say that your employees actually also in some states, California being one of them, and the new Massachusetts statute, if it passes, will also have this. They get to come to you and ask you what the salary rate is. So now you basically have to go and create salary ranges for all your positions. And that's a headache, right? You know, no one wants to do that. 
But just to do that once you actually start to post for positions for positions where you're not posting, then it wouldn't be applicable to actually put the strangers. Unless they ask you if you're in one of those jurisdictions that requires you to make that available when they ask you. So California is one of those jurisdictions. So I can send you if you want more information on salary conference, I can send you yeah. lots more information. It's it's the it's the 2023 topic. <laughs> Everybody's talking about it. Um, and it's you know, every year we kind of cycle through what's the cool new thing, paid leave for a while, now we're on to salary transparency. So and also, you know, worry about your cybersecurity data concerns when they're working from home. You want to have a laptop if you're giving you want to give them a laptop, not have them use their own computer, and you want to be able to kill that device instantaneously when you, when you fire them. So job postings, as I said, listing the pay range, market rate for employer employees location. So a lot of my clients complain to me that they hiring someone in Utah, they still are playing Massachusetts, California rates because that's what some of the big boys are doing too, right? So if Google's paying that, paying California rates to people in Utah, they have to compete the same way as well. And they're finding that frustrating. Equal pay laws, I sort of touched on that. Massachusetts has the strictest equal pay law in the country. You only have six criteria in which you can distinguish people. So if you have two people in the same job, if they're making different amounts of money, it has to fall into one of these six criteria. Um, some of them are obvious, seniority, performance, right? These are not hard concepts, but sometimes we find, but what isn't one of them? They asked for more. <laughs> uh, the recruiter said, I had to pay this now, like that the rates have gone up. So when you start to hire higher, like if, let's say you have nine people who program Java, you need to bring in a new one. The recruiter tells you, well, now these people make 100,000, your people make 90. So you're gonna have to bring all of them up to that same level. You cannot bring the other, right? So you have to level that playing field. When you said you have to bring all of them up, you're saying, so you bring a $100,000 person and you just uh, across the board, just say, okay, now I'm gonna bring everybody up. Yes. Independent of performance. Unless you can get those six criteria, you can fall into one of those six criteria. Uh, that's a Massachusetts problem. In other states, you can have, there are other factors that you can take into to consideration. But again, you got to be careful when you're dealing with men, women, and then in some other states, it's going to be racial too. Massachusetts is just men and women right now. So, and of course, your posters, handbooks, and I-9. So when you're hiring people for virtually, how do you I-9 them? There is a process. <laughs> it is on the government's website. They will they can walk you through how to do it um, because you're not actually seeing them in person, obviously. Your handbooks, let's say you have a handbook that's geared towards Massachusetts employers, mm -hmm. you're gonna need to have an addendum for the states that you have people in, particularly for these very high risk states, like a state like New York, they have an adorable habit of every time they pass a cute new statute, they require that you give your employees certain information, very lengthy information. Is this rocket science? No, we have addendums for all the states. Like if you want to talk to us, we'll give you one. It's not a big deal to us but you do need to make sure that they're consistent with the rest of your employment laws, right? So a lot of our clients struggle with this lowest common denominator, highest common denominator concept, right? Do you give the people in Kentucky the same thing you give the people in California? Well, you can't give them paid leave unless you want to. That's That would be unusual because then you'd be financing it. There are certain states that have certain laws that you're going to have to comply with and the good part of the middle of the country has none of those laws, right? So you have to decide, do I though still pay for jury duty in Kentucky, even though I'm not required to? And in Massachusetts, I am required to pay for three days of jury duty. It's stuff like that. You want to have that stuff going through your head. And then when we're dealing with like equal employment opportunity laws, I do say highest common denominator on that. You're not going to say just because you can discriminate against someone in one state that you will, you're going to put all your protected classes up front in your handbook so that it's clear that you're, you're protecting all of them. Are there size thresholds where this stuff is not enforced? Like, if you're a small business, or is it is it starting from and you know your first employees? You have to have oh a salary ladder. And, you know. So for for that ad thing, um, there are some of the states are 15 employees, um, but not New York City, and that's the problem. One. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it it really does depend on the jurisdiction. When we're talking about sizing of employees, like the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the sort of federal wage and hour and all state wage and hour laws are going to be one employee across the board. It doesn't matter how many you have. When you're dealing with things like the Family Medical Leave Act, which is rather useless now in the state of Massachusetts, because we have a much more powerful law that goes ahead of it, um, 50 employees. So let's say you're a master's based employer and you have 60 people here, but you have smatterings of people all over the country. 
none of those people are covered by the FMLA because even though you're over 50 here, none of those people are at a location that's within 75 miles of 50 people, right? So that's part of the FMLA is 50 people within 75 miles. But most of my clients are going to choose to give FMLA-ish benefits of 12 weeks of leave to those people in the other states because it's consistency, right? And it also makes it easier for you or your HR person to decide what to do. So you're not just making random decisions about giving this person leave because you feel bad for them, but not this other person because you think they're faking it. Does that make sense? <laughs> right. So how, how do these things apply in, in, in employee, employment agreements when you have employees who work, um, you know, uh, hybrid, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so in our case, it's New Hampshire. Lots um, of those, yeah. What applies and what doesn't? Is there, should we require them to be at work a certain number of days? No, okay. most of those New Hampshire commuters, Rhode Island commuters are Massachusetts employees. You're paying their unemployment in the state of Massachusetts. Yes. So they are Massachusetts people. Um, that means that they'll get Massachusetts unemployment and they'll get Massachusetts paid family medical leave. It's all good for them. That 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 they'll prefer that <laughs> um, because otherwise, you know, New Hampshire pays a lot less in unemployment. It pays nothing. Well, actually, there's a voluntary New Hampshire program now for paid leave. It's really weird. Typical New Hampshire, live free or die kind of <laughs> strangeness <laughs> to it. I honestly, like, when I read it, I was like, what? What is this? <laughs> um, it's very strange, but. The, there was a fight during the pandemic. The state, New Hampshire, got really upset and wanted the tax money mm -hmm. from all those people that were now in New Hampshire. But Massachusetts is like, they're still ours. So, um, like I said, with handbooks, you just have to make sure they know about their legal rights where they live. What, particularly for people, again, in, in the very progressive states that have a lot of rights, they need to know that they can take paid family medical leave. They need to know that they get paid X amount. And you need to know certain things. So let's say you want to not pay people on the day they're fired. Well, you can do that in a lot of states, not Massachusetts, but you can do it, not California, but you can do it in the vast majority of them. You need to make sure you're complying with those various state laws. And you may want a handbook that says employees will be paid on their last day of employment unless otherwise permitted by state law. But then you still have to know what the state law is, right? So, no. Quick question. Sure. Um, and this may come up. I believe, but uh, the Cal if I remember from the California, 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 there's they can take all sorts of leave, but like, yes, uh, go to school, voting, all sorts of things. Can we include that as part of our standard PTO? Is it or is it additional, or can we just ignore it? So almost <laughs> all of California's leave laws are unpaid. So except for their family and their disability one, um, so they can. If they want to be paid, they have to use their leave, their paid leave to, to fill that in. Um, and that's going to be the case in pretty much every state, um, except for like things like jury duty. But interestingly, California doesn't mandate jury duty. Okay. Strange little things. If you have less than 10 employees, is there any downside to not having an employee handbook? Uh, it was kind of a backwards question. The question is, if I only have 10 employees, should I have a Yeah, I guess go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, there is value to you in that you will be able to answer questions quicker, mm -hmm. right? So you won't have to make value judgments and then be accused of giving one thing to one person and not to another. And since you are covered by disability laws, based on like your question about numbers of employees, yeah. numbers of employees does come into play with discrimination laws. Um, you have to have six in Massachusetts to be covered, but if you have 10, congratulations. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're part-time or full-time, by the way, six humans count. Mm -hmm. um, and federally, those numbers go 15 and 20, depending on which statute we're talking about. So yeah, vacation definitely should be written down in the policy. Paid family medical leave has to be a policy. You have to give everyone notice about it. Um, I'm talking about, these are just the things that you have to have, right? Um, something called the safe harbor, which mm -hmm. allows you to sort of get out of jail free if you actually make an accident with someone, um, pay, and then har anti-harassment law. Okay. Um, Smith, we have a question from the cheap seats. Yes, and you don't have to turn it off because it's not on yep. my screen. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> does a non-compete apply to contractors? It depends on the state. There, every, there are all sorts of different non-compete laws. Massachusetts's does, Washington's does. Illinois does, um, but you have to look at the individual statutes. Will that vary significantly if you're uh, using a subcontractor, which is a individual versus a corporation or something? No, uh, the corporations are not considered independent contractors, right? In the same way that a human is. Like, did you 
you can't, if you have a business to business agreement, right. you've sort of moved yourself into a different market where it's more the FTC cares about you more than the states care about you. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so but right. not if it's just a fake business where someone's LLC, but they're really Joe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so I think I've already mentioned the confidentiality restrictor covenants. Just be very careful this game of saying, oh, you know how I'll fix this California problem? I'm just going to give them a Massachusetts-based non-compete. It'll be fine. No, you can't do that. Some states, particularly Massachusetts, California, New York, own their people. They are extraordinarily possessive, and they specifically have statutes that say you may not do this to arguments. Arguments are under our law. Most states, it'll say whichever state has more interest in it. And like, look at a state like Oklahoma. Oklahoma allows you to have what we would call a choice of law provision. But then they're going to look at whose state, which state has the most interest in this employee and whether or not the thing you're trying to enforce against their person is a violation of their public policy. Interestingly, Oklahoma does not allow non-competes. They're a little California-like. So, and why is that? Because North Dakota is the same way, natural gas. Um, <laughs> but because of that, if you try to put that Oklahoma person under a Kansas non-compete, you're still going to get a backfire because when you get to court, the court's going to go, no, no, that's against our, our state's public policy. So these tricks don't work terribly well. Um, severance agreements. Again, state law, there are all sorts of weird tricks. The Me Too movement caused this like confidentiality thing where they didn't want confidentiality provisions inside non compete You got to be careful about those things. Just again, have somebody take a peek at it. Termination paperwork, certain paperwork that has to be given to people when they're fired. Make sure you have it. Your payroll company can help with a lot of this stuff um, about papers, right? So if you have a payroll company like ADP, they should be able to give you the notices you're supposed to get. Um, hopefully. So what about with all the employees that we've got that are in different locations that have signed a contract with the jurisdiction is, for instance, Massachusetts space? Do we have to go and amend those contracts at this point? So it's a question of sometimes it's better to let things lie. That's a kind of a question I I, I kind of need to see the situation. If you have an unenforceable agreement in California, you should get rid of it, right? Like there's certain things where I'm going to want you to go in and fix it. Like one of my clients gave everybody the wrong agreement. Mm -hmm. And so it took us about three years, but every time someone was getting a bonus, we fixed the agreements, right? So when we have these opportunities, mm -hmm. we can go in and, and, and fix the problem. So yeah, but remember, with non-competes in particular, we're mostly going for deterrence. We're not mm -hmm. really going to enforce them. Yeah. You know, I know everyone says, oh, they're not enforceable. They are. They are 100% enforceable, but, you know. Um, really quick, I, sure. it's going to sound ridiculous, but it's not. I, we, had a, we had a remote employee at one point just let us know that you moved to California. Yes, I have uh, seen that happen. Yeah, and... We had no idea what to do. Yeah, okay. you can fire them if you'd like, or you're going to have to register to do business in California. Yeah, well, that's what we end up doing. Yeah. yeah, but that's expensive because California loves their taxes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that that's the one state that I will have my the corporate people will buck, buck up against me and go, I don't want to register to do business there because they will grab tax um, stuff. I, years ago, we had an employee um, that my partner was on the board for the, this organization shut the company was shut down the cfo was still doing some work she moved to california right because it was a dead entity they were just doing wrap-up work cost them a fortune just because she moved to california <laughs> she was like working like five hours a week but stuff happens right yeah we're fortunate to have moving out of california okay, yeah. there you go that kind of works here again. uh it's still got nice weather and um vibrant businesses mm -hmm. so practical concerns employee work performance productivity product yeah, productivity and production. How are you going to monitor them? How do you know who's working, when they're working? You need to set expectations for your people. So we have a lot of policies that we have worked with clients to create that says what you expect of them, where you want their office to be. It should be, you know, in a private place where there's equipment, there's no children around, there's no, you know, pets. We try really hard to say these are your set hours. We expect you to be able to respond to emails within X amount of period of time, right? These are the sort of things that our clients have started doing because they can't find their people during the day. And then they find that they've logged on at midnight and you're there like, well, what, why, you know, what's going on? I need to find them. So it's all about policies, training them, communication, all of that stuff. Let's talk about the equipment. We do have problems getting it back sometimes. So what I found during the pandemic that the best thing if I'm going to fire someone that I'm, it's a dangerous termination, we have a courier show up about a half hour after the termination and pick yep. up the stuff. And it's been working beautifully, you know, because that FedEx box, sometimes they bring it back, 
then they lose it, they lose the shipping label, it you know, comes back broken or smashed, things can go wrong. You know, it's up to you how much money you want to invest in getting the equipment back. We also have taken a lot of precautions in our termination letters write things that say things like from this moment on you may not access our systems you may not right because we've had people go in and destroy the computers set them back to factory settings we've had people steal the code get back onto the servers right all these kinds of things and that way if we put it in that they're not allowed to do that now we've got them under a law called the computer fraud and abuse act um, which is a really powerful law um, it's actually a federal crime or a federal civil case and we even had the FBI come in on one of our cases and the guy ended up getting uh, convicted and deported. So there are things that we can do, but it helps if you have the right paperwork to, to fix us with that. Just to add to the, so that we do that for our clients, which is remote. So we can just shut everything off. Yeah. We know they're terminating an employee yes. at 9 a.m. on Monday. Every, all access is shut off. And yeah. then at that point, they're just trying to retrieve a brick. Right. So it's definitely that's what we want. That's my gold standard. And you don't have to have a huge company to do no. that. Yeah. You just, just have to have, have a thing right? installed on the laptop, that, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. And it preserves everything on the laptop. But then we have a fight with them about their baby pictures, right? Mm -hmm. How do I get my baby pictures off the computer? And we always say, just give us the computer back. We're going to stick a thumb drive and mail the baby pictures back to you. <laughs> um, we also have a tendency to find bad things when we start going through people's computers. Um, we wish people wouldn't do the stuff they do on their computers. <laughs> um, so my business hires all contractors. Are there any watch outs about hiring contractors for specific? Yeah, California, Massachusetts, you're probably breaking the law. Um, but that's because we're going to get to it in a second. It's really hard to have independent contractors in those states. Um, they use what's called the ABC test. And we'll get to that in one second. Um, so what are the minutes here? So you need to make all, sure that the policies you you have allow you to foster this work environment, this remote work environment. Okay. Um, so, question. yeah. Um, some people work part, you know, work from home a couple of days and right. in the office. Are we talking exclusively to people that are permanent or do we need to do something for those folks? I think you need to do something with anybody who's at home because, particularly for those that are at home time. a couple of days, then yeah. they might pop out to do this. And you may be totally fine with them popping out to do stuff. You know, yeah. efficient people. Can get things done during the day and then you know work a little bit more and that may be fine with what the kind of employee they are however if you need them to be accessible to you then you need to have policies that foster that it's whatever works for your environment right well if you have those policies you decide to enact those policies then how do you administer them employee to employee because maybe you have someone who is extremely efficient and it's fine if they pop out but now you have a written policy that says you know, X, Y, Z. I mean, how do you, what's what that? What we usually find? say is you have to be available. So if they're on their cell phones and they're, you know, responding to their emails on their cell phone, they're available to you. They're answering the phone. We've just found that post pandemic, sometimes people disappear for hours and their bosses are trying to call them and they're not, you know, they're completely AWOL. And that is a very big frustration. We only go after the problems. If, if you're not, if everything's good, if we could mostly get a hold of you, if it took us a half hour, that's fine. You know, nobody's going to get mad about that. Um, so if you had a misclassified employee, if they were an independent contractor when they should have been an employee, or you classified them as salary when they should have been hourly, when people are working at home, no one's keeping track of the time. We don't even have key card entries. We, you know, yes, maybe you have to log into a system, but sometimes they stay logged in when they're not working. We've had a lot of people be able to abuse the system and then say they were working 20 hours a day and then sue us. Like we've actually had trolls, people, there's one woman we caught, we were her third victim and we went on, we went on the docket and saw that there were two other companies that she sued. Now, we don't even know how many others that she had worked for. She would work for a year in a job she knew that was misclassified. It's a very common misclassification, an inside salesperson. Um, and then she would sue for the overtime and claim to work ridiculous amounts of hours. And, and when I pointed it out to the lawyer saying, your client is a troll, She'd been a lawyer on all the other cases. She said, yes, but there's nothing illegal about that. And I was like, that's true. But when I get in front of a jury, she's going to look like a crook. <laughs> but, but the truth was, we had broken the law. We owed her money. It was bad. Um, and in Massachusetts, trouble. Whatever she owed, she's owed three times that amount. So, um, so people working odd hours, like I said, without authorization, no child, elder care saying they're working full time. People working at more than one job, you know, you've heard about those people on the news. They do exist. They're rare, though. Um, <laughs> that's hard. Um, then the difficulty of coaching, managing, and terminating them, because now you're terminating people remotely. Um, like I said, there's 
so many tricks. So let's talk briefly about misclassification because I can't get into it deeply. Just know that that's what plaintiffs love. They love these misclassification cases because they're very hard for us to win. And even when we have a good argument, we're going to be in litigation for years. Even if you have employer's practices liability insurance, it will not protect you from the judgment part. Some of them don't even protect her defense costs for wage and hour. Yes. Can you repeat that? Really talk employers, about the EPL. Yes, EPLI. Employers EPLI, because that's liability. a very delicate issue. Okay. Yes. You think you have it, but in reality, it's you true. may not have it. Right. So, exactly. what I, how to avoid it? Because I'm just in the process of renewing my EPLI. So, you want to make sure that employer practices liability insurance covers the wage and hour claims. They will probably not cover the judgment. That's pretty common because if you broke the law there, they don't want to be responsible for the damages. Yep. You want at least it to cover the defense costs, your attorney. Because then you're not terrified as the bill keeps going up about the fight, right? Yeah. If you are a Massachusetts employer, this is extremely important. And some other states have this as well. You get to pick your lawyer. You do not have to be shuttled to, to panel counsel yeah. that's being paid $150 an hour. Massachusetts law says that the insurance company cannot do that to you. They will say they can. They can't. We write a cute little email that goes, as you know, in Massachusetts, we have like a form thing, <laughs> and then they approve us. Uh, do you have a checklist of all the things about the EPLI, what the company should I can, I can have that done. We can create something like that. That's that's an actual really good idea. I will also tell you, if you ask me later, which companies I like and don't like, because um, <laughs> I, I have a lot of insight in which ones don't. Like right now, I have a client that is legitimate I, I i actually had to hire them insurance counsel which i don't this is sure. one of the only times i've ever done this because they are being denied coverage and it's ridiculously stupid like they it's basically what happened was they got an eeoc claim and then the same day the eeoc withdrew the claim and said never mind you don't have to do anything so they didn't notify the insurer and then 10 months later they got sued and they were denied for not reporting it. yeah like we just settled the epli we didn't have to pay anything because I had an employee who tried to punch the system because she fell down at home. Yeah. And she said that because of the stress at work. No, <laughs> no I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it may sound very funny. No, but it is. So in the state of Ohio, so she, was, she wanted to get a disability claim of 15. Yeah. And we said no. She was there for, and we showed all the proof because the only way you can win against all these things is providing a lot of facts and a lot of data. Oh, we're going to talk about the data and stuff in the And that's the only way. So we had a workman's storm hearing yesterday, yeah. and we gave all the proof, and, the, and they just said, okay, we'll talk about it later, but it looks like we're going to disallow her. Well, but those are the things which are really you're, 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 you're being good at helping the workers' comp lawyer, but usually they're on their own. They'll They'll litigate or not litigate like i have a client now that is convinced there's fraud going on can't get the workers comp person to investigate we have no control over those lawyers epli lawyers that you have control over you decide whether to settle you decide what your lawyer is you get a lot more power with employer practice liability and even though it is a massive headache for us we want you to have it because it'll make you behave in a more rational fashion it'll give you that security that the worst that's going to happen to you is twenty five thousand dollars or whatever your yep. was. Okay. Um, and it's actually very affordable if you've never had a claim. Um, so particular focus, like I said, on the plaintiff's lawyers, these are very strict requirements, wage and hours, like insanely strict, potential personal liability. So if you're the CEO, president, treasurer, CFO in Massachusetts, you're on the hook for that. Um, they'll come after you personally, homestead your houses. Um, just a little side note there, you get an umbrella policy, can't hurt you. Yeah. Um, penalties that trouble damages that automatic thing we're going to talk about it more in a second it's insanity it and there's a bill now so please tell your legislators to fix the insanity um it's a really fair fix um what's that called the, the, new, the new one oh i don't know what it's going to be called it's, oh, it's oh. an amendment to the wage act oh, okay so i don't i don't it's are you gonna have that in your newsletter no but we should yeah <laughs> um I, I'll, I'll get that information yeah. um, I just, you know i got sued under that and um and I email every congressman, and they wouldn't even call me back. I said this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. So, if there is a new bill, there's I know that there are two reps that are sponsoring it. Um, yeah. Please help with it. I will support it. Although honestly, it'll really cut down on my business, but that's okay. Oh, I don't ever oh, sue okay. under the wage act. No, okay. no, no, no. Thank no. you. I, I, we are defense counsel only. Um, it's really easy to exploit innocent mistakes, right? Very, very easy, and that's the frustration. 
We're not trying to make people better employers. We're trying to catch you. It's a game of gotcha. And that isn't right, you know? Um, ignorance of the law, not an excuse. Okay. So the two big areas of misclassification, independent contractors, exempt, non-exempt. Um, independent contractor misclassification. I'm going to do this super fast because I can do an entire talk on this. Individual, you have to get all three of these. It's an and, not an or. All three have to be true. And this is the same test in California, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. We are the ABC states. Um, and we in Massachusetts were first. You can thank the big day. Individuals free from control and direction in connection with the performance of the service, both under their contract and the performance of the service. In fact, you cannot control them. They are free agents. Ah, uh -huh, as if that's happening. The service is performed outside the usual course. It's just a course, sorry, <laughs> of business of the employer. This is the one they all fail. They all fail this test. It is virtually impossible to pass the second or the B prong of this test, okay? Think about it. If you're a painter painting an accountant's wall, you are not doing what the business is doing. If you are doing anything related to accounting, you are doing what the business does. Doesn't matter if you're the one doing the website, unless you have a completely outside company or whatever. If you're inside that company working on their website every day, that's their business. Make sense? Okay. The individual is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, profession, or business. I want them to have a business card. I want them to have an FEIN number. I want them to have other clients. <laughs> and that is where we all fall, right? Because they only work for you. Hmm. Not going to do it. Now, tell me, if you're breaking the independent contractor statute, is that the end of everything? No. Sometimes it's a no foul, no harm situation, right? They're making more than minimum wage. They're not working more than 40 hours in a week. They're not going to sue you. Um, in some states, there's a little bit of the problem with the unemployment. There's a little bit of the problem with the fact that they're not getting paid family medical leave, but we have an independent contractor contract that says that they should get it themselves. People can buy it themselves in Massachusetts. There's things we can do to control the harm of having independent contractors. And I encourage you, if you go down that path, try to control it, at least. Try to control the risk of doing it. The IRS test is 100 times easier to meet than this. This test is impossible. This is a wage and hour test, okay? The IRS test is a balancing test, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things will fall through the DOR. And DOR uses the same test as the IRS. A lot of things will be perfectly passable under workers' comp, perfectly passable under tax, but they will fail this test, okay? Yes. Um, what about if you're using independent contracts that are outside the country? Yeah, that's whatever the law is on those countries. Yeah, the United States doesn't get care what you're doing. Um, it's, up, it's up to that. You may be violating the laws of another country, but otherwise it's okay. Um, and But I was mentioning before, there is a company in, Ma in Massachusetts, there's a bunch of them in the, in the country, but that's one I know of in Boston, that will help you hire people in other countries as if they're techs. It's like they're they're working for that entity. It's a, kind of like a PEO, you know, right, PEO yeah, is yeah. kind of like that concept. Yeah, we've used remote.com to hire people across the world. Yeah. And they're, they're very easy yeah, them. because they're in charge of them being they're the somebody else is the employer, not you. You're paying for that for that agency yeah. to help um, so the burden is on you to prove that this person is not an independent contractor. If they fail to prove any of the three, the individual is deemed an employee. For workers comp on this subject. If you do have independent contractors, tell your workers' comp carrier that you want them covered too. It's like some change and workers' comp is a pain um, when you don't have it, not when you do have it. Workers' comp is for you, not for the employee. It's it's for your protection. The, fi the financial penalty for misclassification is extreme. 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 And it's where the plaintiff's lawyers are spending all their time. Yeah. It's and, it's, and it's hard because you then get faced with, do I pay my lawyer a ridiculous sum of money or do and or do I capitulate and pay the plaintiff something to make them go away? And nine times out of ten, your business choice is going to be pay the person something and make them go away. I mean, I have a lot of conversations with clients about extortion, and <laughs> because you're going to lose an important aim, right? I well, mean, for for if it's a true misclassification well, and a wage value, they, but they all are, like you said, they almost all of them are according yes. to the law. So when we get to to Reuter, um, the new case, we're we're just paying people now. They come to us and we say, well, okay, we owe you uh, ten thousand. Here's the check for thirty thousand dollars. Go away. We're just doing that yeah. um, because it's utterly frustrating. I will tell you one of the things that bothers me because they get attorneys fees too. Is they'll say to me, "Oh, I've spent you know fourteen thousand dollars on this already," and I'll be like, "That's so weird because I've only spent two. <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> it's odd. 
Um, he's only been out of the bar for three years. <laughs> what is the response? What is the response to my own? Um, we can get it down. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't, don't roll over that fast on that because it's like, come on, dude. Um, but I find I get along with a lot of plaintiff lawyers, and if you just say to them, "Love it," we get it, we understand. If you are, if you don't puff and pretend like you don't know the law, like you, that they don't know the law, if you're not demeaning to them, mm -hmm. you can usually get even a, a lower amount than what the out-of-pocket loss is too. It depends on the situation. Having relationships with opposing counsel can actually be a good thing sometimes. Because um, we, by the way, send them a lot of work. Because we don't go there, <laughs> we don't do their stuff. So. <laughs> I get really excited when one of my people is on the other side. I know I get kind of manipulated a little bit. You want, you want those uh, referrals to keep rolling in? <laughs> so non-exempt and exempt. So hourly salary. Uh, safest always to pay people by the hour. Um, please track their hours, even if you think they're exempt. Um, there are ways to do it. It's not a bad idea. That way, you know your payment threshold. That person can't lie and say they work 90 hours a week. You know how much they work. I know that salary people hate doing that. I get it. But at least have some way of, of checking in with them, you know, so you can argue the other way. If they work more than 40 hours a week and they're you know, hourly non-exempt, obviously they get overtime and they must get minimum wage. Uh -huh. Exempt, so there's several different exempt tests. The main thing is they get at least 684 a week, it's federal. Um, there are some states, California and New York that have higher salary thresholds. So be careful in those states, they're both above 50,000 right now. They're gonna keep going up. Parts of New York are above 60. Actually, I think California may have gone above 60 this year too. So you have to be careful and it's a weekly amount. It does, they have no proration for part-time. Which is important, except that part-time people don't usually work overtime, guys. So <laughs> again, you know, so it goes both ways. Um, and then they have to meet the duties test, right? Professional, administrative, executive, outside sales, computer professionals. Anybody who's doing inside sales, please be careful. Those are almost always a misclassification and the easiest one to catch you at. Um, administrative, also the easiest to manipulate. And we'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that one because that's the one where we see most of the lawsuits that are going to be easy victories. Because what we want to see with that administrative employee, first they have to work in a white collar industry. Okay, they're working in an office, right? Or they're working at home doing office type work. Discretion and independent judgment. It's kind of mushy, right? <laughs> Who has independent judgment and discretion? I don't know. And is it a matter of import to the business? I don't know. Is it is deciding whether to buy paper clips now? No, probably not. Negotiating the copier contract? Okay, now we're a little higher up, right? They have to be doing something of importance, okay? But it also has to be independent and it has to be significant. But you can see how this could, that test in particular can be manipulated. Two reasonable people can look at the same employee, one say salary and one say hourly. So there's another trick we do, which I call them salary overtime eligible. You give them the dignity, because for whatever reason, people think being salaried is more dignified of being salaried, but you also say that they can improve, they can get overtime if they work over 40, and then you tell them to tell you when they work over 40. Um, and then you hope that they don't work. There's also something called a fluctuating work week where you can only pay half time for that. There's tricks, but just be careful that you don't fall into that hole. So inside or outside salespeople that no longer travel. Okay, so those outside salespeople are now sitting there using their phones, problematic. I had the DOL coming after us and I was very upset with them right after the pandemic to go, oh, come on. They couldn't go visit people. Like, <laughs> and they actually gave it. <laughs> like, the TL is not completely irrational. The fact that they weren't knocking on people's doors and selling their, you know, uh, vacuum cleaners after that particular incident made sense. So um, administrative employees who don't exercise the judgment, as I said, making your life easier by just paying a set salary, that's a big one, right? Oh, but I just, it's just easier by just paying them a salary. No, don't do it. Um, allowing empl hourly employees to work after hours. You have a thought Saturday at 10 p.m. You fire off that email to that hourly person. They read it. They just work. So can I train managers to stop doing that? No, but you can train the employees to keep track of their time. That's work. If you're going to keep doing that kind of stuff, just make sure somebody's paying attention. Uh, it does add up, right? That after hours work, those long, you know, looking at the emails. Failing to account for incentive bonus and supplemental pay in the overtime. You can't give people extra money. There's like 10 exceptions for when you can. Be very careful if you're just throwing money at people on a week when they got overtime. You're going to take that regular rate and make it higher. I always say Christmas is a good time to do it because no one's working overtime. 
Ruder, great case. Um, so what's this question? How do commissions are only mostly commission inside sales folks fit in here? Oh, they can be salaried um, as long as they're meeting that salary test so that they can be salaried. In fact, it's very, very common that we have commissioned only salaried people. But just, you know, there's ways to set it up. Ruder versus the city of Methuen. This floored all of us. Those of us who've been practicing in the defense bar for all these years thought if we break the wage act, we call it an administrative error. Oh, we paid two days late. We fired the person on Monday. We didn't pay them till Wednesday, but we paid them on Wednesday. No harm, no foul. They got their check. They cashed it. They didn't make it to court before that Wednesday. We're fine. The most they can get is trouble the interest in that time period. That's what we all thought. Okay. We thought as long as we fix the problem before they sue us, no trouble damages in attorney's fees. Supreme Judicial Court said we were wrong. As soon as you make a mistake, technical error. Even if it's not your fault at all, even if the payroll company screwed up, even if your bank exploded and that's why they didn't process the payment, you now owe trouble damages for your entire payroll. It went out an hour late. So <laughs> what the hell are we supposed to do now? We're writing checks. We're writing checks to whoever sues us every time there's a mistake. Um, and it's extremely frustrating, which is why we're trying to change this. Um, it makes no sense because there's absolutely no good faith defense to anything. Is it a mistake on any pay thing or just on termination? Nope, any pay. So let me give you an example. You've been paying your hourly people bi-monthly because you pay everyone bi-monthly and you don't want to have two different payrolls. Hourly people can't be paid bi-monthly. It's illegal. They have to be paid bi-weekly or weekly. I have clients that I will fight to the death with on this now. I'm like, you must fix it. They're like, why? Why do we need to fix it? We've never been in trouble before. You've literally been breaking the law every single payroll that you're running. Every payroll, you owe those people three times that amount. Every single time. Three times the amount of what? Whatever that payroll was for those hourly people. So if you had 30 people on that payroll, you just, it's astronomical the amounts of money. For each cow? Yeah. Oh my, how far back does it go? Years. Oh, but that's only, that's only though, and just we're not for... Non exempt people, though, right? No, non exempt no, don't have that law. Exempt yes. yeah, people, you've been yeah. paying them monthly. Right. You yeah. broke the law, unless they ask for it. Right. Yeah. You can you ask for it. Yeah, no, we have no hourly. Oh, well, that's another issue that, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When people tell me we have no hourly people, I sometimes go, okay. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe it's fine. <laughs> it depends on the situation, but, you know, often, no. The salary people, you said they should be paid. Monthly, unless they ask for it, how yeah. did it take? Uh, bi weekly or weekly or bi monthly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, we. Nope. Wow. I know. I never, oh, Tons we, of people we do. We used it. to pay monthly and we'd give them when, they, when we hired them, we'd give them a sheet that says, I hereby request to be paid monthly. So you fill that out and sign you know, up and we'll hire you. I worked with Goodwin Proctor yeah. and they didn't ask us to do that and they paid us monthly. And for years I've been like, damn, that statute of limitations ran out. <laughs> <laughs> because, and I remember, it wasn't my intake uh, day, but one of my colleagues, the day she was hired, somebody raised their hand and was like, I really don't want to be paid monthly. And they were like, well, you have to. Every employment lawyer knew it was illegal. And we were all like, but we thought it was no harm, no foul, right? Because, you know, now it isn't. <laughs> what if the, um, a non-exempt employee doesn't submit a time card for that bi-weekly period? You better chase them. Chase them and chase them. Chase them and chase them. Forget. Because it's your fault, not theirs. I mean, that's the, the miracle of all this. Like, so we had a client misclassified a person. It's a debatable topic of whether the person was misclassified or not. They were. Um, but like, I had some things I could say at least. <laughs> I could kind of BS my way through that conversation. Um, and we, I kind of negotiated a settlement with opposing counsel. He's a nice guy. He's a bit of a doofus, but he's a nice guy. And, um, all of a sudden, he dawned on him that they were prevailing wage um, places. He was working on state projects. And all of a sudden, that number went through the <laughs> roof um, because now I was prevailing prevailing wages. And it was insanity. And when he figured that out, and he was right, and sometimes we they never figure stuff out. Sometimes we can get easier settlements because the other side is just not that good at their job. Um, but so we had no choice. We had to pay them. So if the person doesn't submit their time card and we're constantly hunting, What's our fire them? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds weird, right? It's the same thing with overtime. People complain to me all the time. This person worked overtime. I didn't authorize the overtime. Can I not pay them? The answer is no. You have to pay them, and then you have to turn around and fire. Could them. you pay them the approximate wage? Say, for instance, they would be twenty-four hours per month a week, 
and they forgot to put the time in or something like that. Yeah, you could do that if they're if it's really bad. I would I would certainly err on the side of paying them something, something. so so that yeah, whatever you're traveling is not the right number. And 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 honestly, who's that lawyer bringing the case going? Well, you should have known how much. Like, <laughs> but that, it's not going to be a great case. Another yeah. situation, okay, it just happened uh, during Christmas and New Year's. We hire a lot of medical coders, and when you do inpatient medical coding, it's very cumbersome and very detailed. Yes. Okay, there was a lot of backlog backlog at one of the sites. One of the ladies, because she had a free time, dialed in and did some work. Right. Okay, it was nothing illegal or anything, but then she charged us. So we charged the uh, site for the money. They said we did not approve it. Then we explained to her why she did it because there was a backlog of a lot of uh, surgeries, right. okay? They still did not approve it. So in that case, I had to pay her, right? Yes. And I told her next time, even if they have 10,000 backlogs, don't worry. Yeah. They're not going to pay, it's their problem. She's a good employee. Yeah. She just, yeah. yeah. Fell into a trap. It, it's unfortunate, but she gets paid. Yes, she has got yeah. paid, right? It's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a huge frustration. Like I have a, a bunch of tutoring type service clients and um, they're interacting with parents and we say to them, we only want you to work X amount of hours, but they're responding to emails and stuff yeah. like that. And and we sort of get into these fights where we say, no, we didn't want you to do that, right? Like, but you can see where it's frustrating to both sides on that. Yeah. Like you want me to do my job, but you don't want me to do my job. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, Okay. You know what? I mean, in that case, a PECOM kind of helped us out. Um, oh, yeah. PECOM, our payroll provider. Yeah. They kind of helped us out. He said, this is what we have to do. So payroll companies, they're not responsible for your errors. Yeah. Okay. And that this is sometimes like, why did they tell me I was supposed to pay overtime or blah, blah, blah. That's not their job, right? Yeah. However, sometimes you'll get a really good person who will notice a glitch and tell you. Then you're blessed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it isn't their fault when... Yeah, Great, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I get a lot of like, but I kind of look up at it. Uh, one quick thing about Reuter with um, firing people. Let's say you're really mad at someone and you want to fire them today, but you can't get the check ready. What you're going to do is suspend them and pay them to the next day, okay? So that yeah. you can get that check out the door. Or you can even say your termination date is this, just go home, right? You don't have to make it a formal suspension or anything. Just, I'm going to pay you through Tuesday, but get the heck out of here now. Um, that kind of thing. You don't want to mess that up because if you're so mad that you're firing someone on the spot, they probably hate you too. It's, it's probably a mutual thing. Mutual hate. Exactly. <laughs> um, so the second prong here, if you find a mistake, should you fix it? This one is what bothers me the most about the Reuter case. I will say to a client, you're making a mistake. This payroll is wrong. Now if we fix it, it's like you alerted them to everything we've done before. You've misclassified a person. Do we fix it? Well, no, we now we just alerted them to trouble damages, right? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that I that I find from the employee's perspective actually very disturbing about this decision because it's not allowing us to go back and fix the things that we've done wrong. The other thing, commissions. We, we talked about commissions briefly a second ago. Under our wage act, which was written way before anyone in this room was born, hey, people have to be paid within six or seven days. I don't know why we have a choice. <laughs> six or seven days of the day they perform the service. How do you all pay commissions? You pay them the following month, right? Yeah. But we write them down as due and determinable. We have this whole language that we stole from the wage act that says wages are due when they're calculatable and due and owing. So when we write the commission plans, we say that they are calculatable and due when the client pays, the customer pays, and they're due and owing the following month. Is that delay okay? We don't know. We don't have a case on that yet. So we're all really nervous. But what I will say is, Look at your commission plan, make sure they're worded very clearly about how you're paying, when it's owed, use the statute's words, cross our fingers, and hope they fix the law before somebody figures out that commissions is the next big gold mine. What's the, um, what, what is your recommendation in terms of uh, you contract with a customer and then for some reason they don't pay? We have language we put in there about flying back commissions. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, so, you know, every, Client is different on this, though. Some people pay commissions based on the sale. Mm -hmm. Some when the customer pays. Everybody's a little bit different. You want to define when when it's owing to the person as it is. You can advance them. You can do um, draws, things like that. So uh, we have an employee who is currently hourly. There, he should he should be exempt from everything I'm here. Okay. Uh, That's a weird but, one. That yeah, I just cut that. <laughs> uh, we're just talking here about that, uh, but. but you're always, safe by, no, you're always safe being hourly. 
They're, you're never breaking the law paying a salary person on an hourly basis. It's the other way that's problematic. Okay. So you don't have to fix it if the person's happy. Particularly computer people, they're the only people who can be exempt programmers, um, but still paid an hourly wage is, is actually how they're, they're, they just don't get overtime. There's a whole separate test for computer professionals. Oh, um, so it's a little bit different. And they have to be like programmers, they can't be the help desk guy. They have yeah, to. It's, it's, what about yeah. consultants? Though? If you yeah. go onto DOL's web, web page, you'll see there's a, a nice little cheat sheet on, on computer professionals. Yeah. We've got people who are not just doing development, but they're doing analysis work configuration. Go look at the test. The test is, is they actually, the DOL actually has really nice fact sheets on their website that will give you a, a starting point to go for whether or not someone's in the meeting an exemption. Or I'm happy to tell you too, but free. <laughs> let's go with the free resources first, right? Um, so let's talk about leaves of absences, um, because I would tell you I spend a good chunk of my day talking to clients about people who are taking leaves of absences or need medical accommodations. So obviously we have a federal law, that's the one I talked about before, the FMLA, that 50 employees within a 75 mile radius, they have to have been there a year, work 1,250 hours, it's an unpaid leave, max is out at 12 weeks, except for military service leaves, which rarely come on. Massachusetts, we have the Massachusetts Paid Family Medical Leave. Please tell me you gave notices to all your employees on January 1st of this year, explaining that the rates went up and all of that stuff. So it has a lot of requirements. Okay. If you don't meet the requirements, it's not the worst thing in the world if you didn't give the notice. Give the notice now. Put it in your handbook. Make sure it's posted somewhere. Oh my gosh, we're all virtual. We don't post things. Put it on your on your uh, <laughs> website. Um, we're I have a extern that I just tasked with the job of creating a document for me that has all of the state required posters. So that I could just fling that document at clients from now on and not have to answer any more questions on it. Um, I think it's going to be a really useful document, but that way they know what they have. To, and it's going to also have the termination paperwork in it. So like, it's like here, click here and you see what you have to, here are the three forms you give in California. Here are the, you know, stuff like that. I'm really excited about this. Uh, lovely Northeastern student who's going to save my life. <laughs> I love that program, the co-ops. Um, so Massachusetts, no minimum number of employees. Your nanny's covered. Uh, no minimum employment requirement. First day of work, they're covered. Um, covers former employees and temp. That's true, isn't that funny? You can fire the person, they still get it. <laughs> Paid, but with a cap, right? So it's 50% up to, I think it's now at 1,300 and something or something. It's, it's got, it went up a lot this year. <laughs> Job protected family leave is 12 weeks. Medical leave is 20 weeks. Highest in the country, aren't we proud? <laughs> um, and the annual cap together is 26. So you're saying that if someone, you either fire someone, somebody leaves, mm -hmm. they're still eligible? To yeah, from the state or your insurance carrier if you got an exemption. How many people got the exemption? No one has their private insurance plan? I should look into this. It's actually much better. Um, most of our clients, because you guys have mostly white collar employees, You'll find that they'll save money if they use private insurance instead of paying into the state program. Oh, really? Yes. Um, uh, it's not a bad system. <laughs> so, and it, and it works the same way. They're going to make a decision. They're going to default to Massachusetts law. Your employees will find that they'll get their checks faster and the process will go a little bit smoother for them. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I'm going to let this know insurance company guys, right? But we've found that it's been fairly successful for most of our clients. Also, it gives you a little bit more flexibility when you're writing your PFML policy, particularly for those of you who have high performing employees that you like and want to be nice to, um, you will be able to true, allow them to use part paid time off to true up their benefits so that they're getting 100% pay during that time period. You cannot do that if you're on the state program. The state program will not allow you to use paid time off. Any paid time off will walk, wipe out the PFF. So it's a little bit more of a nice benefit for your employees. So just to make sure I hear you, I should have a, a handbook for my nanny. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I, I promise you, I do pay my nanny above the table. Um, yes. And uh, that is fine. That is how I do things. I have workers prop. But as then you're then you're like the gold standard already. No, you do not need a handbook. Um, it's fine. You, you are supposed to have a contract and you can get that off of the yes, one. Yeah, yeah, you can get that off the website. Okay. Because um, there is a special law domestic service workers staff in Massachusetts. As long as you're under that, you're fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> Massachusetts, wow. we do it better. You don't want to be, I didn't want to be an employment lawyer in like Kentucky. What would I do with myself? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So what's the real fun part of PFML? Our retaliation provision. It is, so I, I have a joke with PFML and I'll share it with you, which is just like California passes it. Wow, oh, we're the first state to do it. I mean, Rhode Island has this lame thing they've had for years. It's like a hundred bucks a week. I don't really count it. Um, but California's like, oh, we're so cool. Then New York does it. Oh, we've done it a little bit better. And then Massachusetts is like, hold my beer because <laughs> okay, our fifth or sixth in the states to do it. But we just went like way out into left field on this. Okay. Our retail, everyone has a retaliation provision. Don't get me wrong. Every statute has a retaliation provision in it. Ours has this thing that for six months after they come back, six months, there is a presumption that you broke the law if you do anything to them that could hurt them, discipline them, fire them, you know, demote them, whatever. A presumption. And how do you get over that presumption? You need clear and convincing evidence. Okay, you've been, you've watched TV, right? You know what a burden of proof is, right? So you know, beyond a reasonable doubt is what criminal kind of that's like 98% mathematically, because you're all, probably all math people more than me. Preponderance of the evidence, that's the civil standard, and that's 51%. Clear and convincing is 75, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like right in the middle of, it's a very high standard <laughs> for you to win your case for retaliation when you're sued for it. So, and the burden is on you to prove that it wasn't retaliatory. So now you've got the burden of proof and you have to prove it at 75% that you're accurate. It's not easy, <laughs> but where's the handbook come in? Pre-existing employment rule or policy is deemed clear and convincing evidence. So you can show they broke something that you have a written rule on. This also works for unemployment, right? Then that's another thing that you can use to protect you. This is the beauty of writing things down is sometimes it will protect you going forward. They're not legally required, but they're useful. So protecting against these retaliation claims. Like I said, negative changes shall not include trivial or subjectively perceived inconveniences. Okay, so that's the best thing we've got. I've got a woman claiming that we're overly enforcing smoke breaks on her right now. Okay, she's being allowed to have two, not eight. I got the man letter. <laughs> Haven't heard back from him yet after I explained to him how stupid that was. We'll see what he asks for. But this is the kind of stuff, some stuff that's going on is that we're getting these stupid demand letters about everything we do. She doesn't have the desk she wants. That was also part of this letter. <laughs> People are insane. So what it means in practice, employee takes four weeks of leave, they have six months anti-retaliation for leave. Then they take four more weeks of leave. They get six more months. You can literally be on PFML all year and in this bubble continuously for your entire employment. It drives me crazy. At some point, we just have to fire them and take the chance. <laughs> so like, there's just no other way around it, guys. Because you cannot talk, because a bad employee could just torture you forever otherwise. Um, so what do I want you to do? I want you to have paperwork <laughs> that allows me, and I want you to have it before they go out on that leave. So what does that really mean is that I need you to keep this paperwork. So you need to request for the leave, the letter designating the leave, certification for healthcare provider, fitness for duty certificates. All of these things need to be in your PFML policy that you want them, that you need them. We have this new fabulous weird thing where they don't apply for PFML. And all of, I, I was on the phone with a whole bunch of management lawyers and I was like, what are we doing in this situation, guys? What do you, like, what do you guys think we should be doing? They're not applying for it. Are they on it? Are they not on it? <laughs> What's going on? We, they're at, not at work. Are we holding their job? So we've come up with a, a system of how to protect companies in those situations because people are weird. They do things that make no sense. Why wouldn't you take the free money from the government? Why aren't you hitting this button and applying? We still don't have an answer to that, but we now have a way of sort of protecting you when they do that because I want the clock ticking. It's very important for me that the 20 week clock starts to tick because if it doesn't, then they're going to get even more time. Can you re um, require employees we, to we, request the? We did write that in there, and it wasn't getting us anywhere. So now we have, we are actually approving it. We're doing it. We're treating it more like FMLA, where we're writing letters saying and asking for the doctor's note ourselves too. Okay. So we're sort of defaulting to our old FMLA. Somebody just says, "Oh, tomorrow I'm going to be on medical leave," or "I'm um, tomorrow." Yeah. There's nothing we can do. Pretty much. I mean, you can still get the doctor's note. You can, you have to notify them that they can apply for PFML, and then you're going to tell them that you've approved it, but you, they, you need to know when the return to work date is, so you're going to need that from the doctor. So there are things we can do. We have ways, we're going to document this thing until, you know, and if they disappear on us, we're firing them. So there are times when people don't get back to us when they're on leaves of absences. 
And depending on how you feel about that person, you may go, oh, this is good, and then just fire them, or you may try to find them. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're worried about them. I mean, I, I've certainly had a lot of clients that are sincerely concerned that that person has disappeared off the radar screen. But what's the worst thing to happen? I've only once fired someone and it turned out they were in a coma. If that does happen, we will undo the firing, right? <laughs> so usually a family member will inform us about the coma. In this particular situation, she had no family. As soon as they come out of the coma, you want to continue that fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's weird. That was, a, that was a particularly weird one. Um, it sticks out in my mind, trust me. So companies must put them on the leave. It's not voluntary. You have to start tracking the time. And, and it's important that your managers understand this. If somebody is like, oh, I, I have to, I can't work. I only work four days a week right now. It's, you know, I have to deal with this medical issue. So I'm going to reduce my hours. We need that on PFML. Like intermittent leaves need to be documented, even if it's just that I get migraines. And so sometimes I miss, you know, two days a week. I, again, the PFML clock has to start to tick um, because that's the law. Otherwise, you'll find that, like, for example, babies, a lot of people weren't applying for the PFML for babies because the companies were paying out of pocket for maternity leaves, and then they need shoulder surgery, right, They're, or they need to take care of the mom, or we just need the clocks to run. I'm not saying we don't give them the other leave. I'm not. I'm just saying I don't want to be sued, right? So <laughs> I'm fixing the problem so that the second leave is not covered by a uh, retaliation. So, so an employee goes out one evening to an axe throwing place and hit their head with yep. the axe and gets a concussion. Tells the manager. And the manager's like, oh, we're gonna do that. Um is that a declaration of leave or is that well it, it depends. Are they out for two days? Then no. They have to be out for a week under PSM. Right? Unless it's a baby, there's no waiting period under babies. But you kind of knew that, right? Babies are babies. <laughs> We're not going to be like, oh, so yeah. the employee doesn't have to apply for this. It just kind of can automatically occur. You're going to designate it as occurring. What if you what if you miss what if you miss and designate and don't do that? What if you just let somebody take the time? Then we were our fear is the clock hasn't ticked on their twenty. Yeah, no, sorry, you got yeah, we, yeah, we just want clocks ticking. Whether they choose to get asked for the state for the money, which they should, because oh, why would you not? Yeah. Um, that's between them and the state, but we're trying to deal with this because we were shocked at the number of people that weren't applying. And it could be that some people are undocumented. We don't know. It doesn't make any, some of them make no sense why they didn't apply. And this for a company, if this person lives on our island, but the company's in Massachusetts, it still applies? As long as their unemployment is Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. Another question. We, there's, there's one guy that we had who was down in Texas, but he used to work for us full time. And then he, and he had to get his green card. So he ended up working for our, this agency. This, Basically, right. the agency, and he still worked for us full time, but through this agency. I'm assuming He's the agency is his employer. Yeah, yeah. So then all of this is not for us. Shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends on each situation is different, but most likely not. Right. Um, so if you do have HR people, HR needs to be brought into this. This is their, their where they shine, right? Um, and what if you have a flexible leave policy? You need to make sure that flexible leave policy deals with the fact that doesn't mean that they can take five months off and be paid, right? So you need to have stop gaps in those flexible leave policies that stop at a certain amount of leave <laughs> and, and put you on the, you know, uh, leave of absence, basically. So that those two policies should in your handbook. I mean, again, not legally required. PFML is legally required, but the a policy you required to have. But the interplay between leaves of absence and vacation, sick leave, all that, that's a nice thing in a handbook to make your life better, to, to sort of figure out how these things are gonna interplay with each other. Um, because, you know, I, I was talking to a client whose handbook, because of addendums had gotten up to over 160 pages. It's addendums, it's not real. It's, no one has to read it. <laughs> um, but we were joking and I said, you know, the reality is the only thing that people read is the vacation and the leave of absence. Yeah. So that's where the focus should be. <laughs> and the only thing the court reads is the harassment policy. Um, don't self-administer this stuff. Don't be like, oh, I'll just be the one who decides whether they get it. Use the law. So coordinating this with existing employer policies, PFML is going to run concurrent with FMLA, and we still have the Mass Parental Leave Act. It's rather stupid now. I mean, it's eight weeks of unpaid leave per baby, which means that if a, a dad of, of twins could get 16 weeks, more than the 12 they get off on PFML, that's about the only difference. Um, it's the only thing I've come up with. <laughs> uh, or if somebody's exhausted their PFML on something else, and then um, the 26 weeks, they might still get masked parental leave. Again, really weird outlier things that lawyers sit around trying to figure out. Um, policies requiring employees to first exhaust available PTO. 
for taking PFML, you can't do that. That was an FMLA thing we could do. We cannot do that under PFML. It doesn't let you force people to use their paid time off. If you're using this private plan that I'm suggesting, like I said, you can let them supplement and determine if you want to pay supplemental pay voluntarily. So I have a lot of clients come to me about maternity leave and paternity leave and how are we going to do this? How much can I pay? I want to be a nice employer. I can walk you through ways to do that. There are lots of ways to be nice in this world. <laughs> and I'm happy to help you make sure that people can take those baby leaves um, without worry. So, because like I have one client who's just telling me, I think this is hysterical. Uh, they have a flexible leave policy and they find their dads are not applying for PFML because why would you apply for PFML if you can just work from home and get full pay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, it's genius. I don't know why I never thought of that. Um, so leaves of absences outside of the PFML, let's say in another state, I mean, uh, a state that voted for Trump. <laughs> Throw that out there. So it's still a reasonable accommodation. The ADA still applies, right? So a leave of absence will be a reasonable accommodation, even if there's no state leave law that applies to that person. Remember, there's this incredibly confusing interplay between state leave laws and disability discrimination and accommodation. It is incredibly messy and ugly, and you should have help with it. This is one thing that we find the biggest issues with. What if they've used up for 20 weeks and they just need three weeks more? Probably then it's a reasonable accommodation, right? I don't know what I just did. Could have been me. Oh, oh, somebody, I think that may be what happened. Somebody exit? No, it's still here. It, it went to gallery. Oh, I got it here. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Oops. <laughs> no, now you're not sharing anymore. Oh, did I do that? Share. You're right. I did that. Okay. Um, so. Oh, oh, it's just thinking. Okay. Um. So you just want to make sure that you're holding that job open if it's not an undue burden, right? So with a reasonable accommodation is what we're looking at is that undue burden concept um, and talk to somebody before you say something's an undue burden, right? That's something you want to check with us because we're going to be very reticent to allow you to go, yeah, yeah, that two extra weeks, that's that I can't do. <laughs> I, did, I did 20, but two more, I can't do it. But an indefinitely, we live for doctors who write, I don't know when this person can come back because then we can fire them. But like, um, we had we had one employee. She was out of Michigan. And she was going through a series of psychological issues. So uh, she would call and say, "Am I going to come next week?" But I can right. work the week after, and then that just proliferated. Yes. Just kept going. Yes, and con that that's something we want to help you manage. Yeah. It, it's a we. It's such a huge part of my day is dealing with those exact <laughs> situations yeah. because we never know when to cut it off. We want to be nice. Yeah, we hope they come back. Right? Yeah. And it's it is extremely hard. And one of the things I always tell clients is I need you to pretend that they have something else, that it's not mental health. I need you to pretend it's cancer or a heart condition. Mm -hmm. And then tell me what you would do in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have to do the same thing. Yeah. And that's where I get, there's a disconnect there, right? Because as much as you're sympathetic to the mental health, at the same time, you're thinking, this is my problem. <laughs> like, why do I have to not have this employee? Right. And we'll work with you to figure out a way to 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 minimize your harm and your risk, mm -hmm. and and sort of move on as best as you can. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is, disability discrimination is really hard for me to define what's a disability and what isn't. Yeah. A little easier outside of Massachusetts, California, New York, but it's not that easy. So pretty much any mental or physical impairment is going to count. Um, and if you don't provide that reasonable accommodation, you're up the creek. That's what most of our demand letters are focusing on, our lack of having of providing that accommodation. What about when that person starts telling customers, oh yeah, I had a mental disability day or something like that? I mean, you, you can talk to them about that. I think that's, I have zero issue. What did I do now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I lost the internet. There. Ah. Yeah. That one was different. Well, you're still on Zoom. Well, let's yeah. see if this fixed it. Maybe it just went on for a sec. No, nope, the share screen is oh, yeah, did. did that go back? Yep. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, they don't have to tell you that they had a disability. They just let's say you see an employee and they're struggling and you don't know why. What are you gonna do in that situation? We should probably go to them and be like, hey, your performance is really no say this way, mediocre. <laughs> like, what's going on? How can I help you improve? Not like it's like you have a mental health issue. Like, but we're not going to diagnose them. Right? But we're going to go to them and have a conversation with them about what's going on. How can I improve your performance? What can we do? They don't have to use those words like accommodation, disability, or handicap. 
you just need to talk to them, right? Don't pry. If they then volunteer, well, I have this medical condition, then you tell them about their benefits that they can have, leaves of absences, whatever, you know, let me know how I can help. And we're going to walk down that path of being the nice employer, accommodating, figuring out how to do what we call an interactive dialogue. Um, and that interactive dialogue is basically having a conversation with them. And if you don't do it, like if you just ignore the fact um, that someone has asked for something and you instead just say no, or if you have a manager, this is the, we'll talk at the end about training your managers about this stuff. The managers have to know how to recognize this stuff, right? The employee says to them, oh, my kid's been sick. They have this horrible condition and I'm just constantly taking them to the doctor. Lights should go off in that manager's head that this is an accommodation question, right? And then they need to take the HR, they need to go to another level. Like somebody needs to be paying attention to those requests. Oh, you know, I, I think I, I'm just under a lot of stress. I have, my therapist wants to see me every day. You know, is this something I can do? Yeah, that's an accommodation request. That is not for the manager to say yes or no to. They need to immediately say, I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Push it to someone else. It's not my problem to solve. Um, that way we have consistency in how we're handling these things. It's not, not ad hoc and you're not going to be liable for that because you are liable when the manager makes mistakes. So what's a reasonable accommodation? I don't know. We we look at each one as they come to us and we evaluate them. It is really hard to say though that something is an undue burden and I'm always going to want to know. So if it's super, super expensive, maybe. If it's going to disrupt the workplace, maybe is when they bring the dog in that has the cute little jacket that says they're an emotional support dog. <laughs> Probably not allowed, but we're gonna put some strict rules on that puppy, right? Like there's things like this that you need to talk to us. This is, in fact, it just went around my office the other day. Who has an emotional support dog policy? <laughs> I, I had to write one in Ohio. Interesting fact, Ohio had a law. I was shocked. <laughs> I had no idea that that, that one surprised me. I, Ohio has like eight laws. Apparently dogs are one of them. Um, I mentioned the interactive dialogue. This is key. You have to have these conversations. The conversations have to be doc, um, documented, right? So, so in my actual question, um, <laughs> so the employee said this to their manager and the manager's like, oh yeah, I'm going to find out. So my sense is we should ask that person, you know, if there's if they need any accommodations. Yeah. So, so. Well, I wouldn't use that word. Is there anything I can do to help you? How long do you think you're gonna be out? Can I get a medical note? If they're only gonna be out for two days, I don't need a doctor's note. In fact, in Massachusetts, I can't ask and they're out until they're out for three days. Uh, every other state is a little bit different. Massachusetts is the hot is the there are other states that are similar to Massachusetts. No one's worse than three days. <laughs> so you can default to that as your highest. Um, but you can't and, and don't be one of those employers it's like every time they're out i need a doctor's note because people don't go to the doctor for everything and we don't right. want them to go to the doctor for everything mm -hmm. um but you do have to have these conversations what's going on when do you think you're going to be back because a concussion could go through it could it can and it can be with with you know inability to focus um oh, maybe wow. be in a dark place yeah. yeah no there's a lot of things that can go with that we just need a doctor's note that explains what they need, and then we'll see if we can accommodate it. And the accommodation might be that we put them in a different job, um, but it's not going to be an obvious answer without the doctor is the one in charge. So, like, I have a client now who said, I don't want to bring this person back. They're a walking workers' comp disaster. And I said, and the doctors cleared them, and they said, yes. I go, guess what? <laughs> you can't stop them from going back. <laughs> the doctor says they're cleared, they're cleared, right? So, we'll have that conversation too sometimes. Uh, uh, like this uh, just testing your tech skills. Yeah. Seriously, guys. Now I'm on their website. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the internet connection. Were you on their internet? Before? Yeah. I am on their internet. Okay. Good. Now they want you to log in. Huh? Oh, and maybe they timed out. No, I think I something. Just for the guest. I want to guest. Yeah. Did that go back? It's going. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to that. Let's talk about some non competes. Um. So you have a newsletter in the packet that's our latest one on the FTC. What do I think is going to happen? The FTC banning our competes? Come on. Like, probably going to be litigating this one for a little bit, right? <laughs> I don't think this one's going into effect. I mean, I can try to here and scare you, but based on my experience with the federal government trying this kind of stuff, someone's going to sue them. <laughs> someone's going to say the FTC has no right to control this stuff. But it could happen. And if it does happen, it 
retroactively wipes out all your non -compete. But then you're in the same boat as everyone else, and what will be will be, right? Like that's the situation. Um, it is going to contain a functional test, which might wipe out some of your non solicits if they're very strictly written. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, even some of your um, confidentiality agreements may be slightly problematic. We don't know. Um, there are a few, you can see at the bottom, a few things that aren't covered by the FTC's jurisdiction. They'll be exempted. Um, but if it does happen, and it applies to independent contractors as well, um, we're going to want to chat with you about your documents um, and how to fix them going forward. So non-solicits are still, would still be valid though, right? Like, Unless like they think reason. they're functionally into a non-compete, right? But so yes, they do. Not taking customers, not taking employees, not taking the, the key to Coca-Cola, the formula. It would be very specific based on the industry, right? Because it, sometimes we write non-solicits that would mean that you couldn't really work anywhere, right? The way we worded them, like potential customers or something. Again, it's possible to non-solicit. And depending on the industry, some industries, like maybe there's only a few clients, right? So somewhat but yes technically speaking it's not getting rid of non-solicits um it's the same thing when we talk about Massachusetts Massachusetts it's not to be allowed as apply to non-solicits or confidentiality or IP um so it's going to be published it was published January 18th they're accepting comments to the 10th um although there is this confusion as whether it's the 20th and then there'll be 180 days if it goes into effect and remember administrations change uh FTC is an administration of the federal government it doesn't have to, um, the next administration could change their minds. <laughs> it's, it's kind of what we see with the NLRB a lot. It'll swing whichever way the administration swings. It's it's going to be a similar situation to that. So if it does go into effect, do you care? Yes, you care because then you have no non-competes anymore. Um, and there is this other thing the FTC is also into when competitors get together and, and do um agreements amongst themselves not to poach each other's people those are those were problematic under obama and they are under biden as well um so employers should just you know do their best figure this out let's talk about massachusetts's current statute which was passed in 20 which went into effect in 2018 so only exempt employees in massachusetts can have non-competes so they better be actually exempt um no non-compete if employees were fired uh without cause or laid off so any layoff doesn't apply to them um, and causes not defined in the statute. So we're going to want you to define it in your agreement. Um, if you don't define it, frankly, the default for cause is pretty good in Massachusetts for employers. It's not a bad standard, but it's better if you define it. You can even define it to the Massachusetts standard. <laughs> Just say what it is. Um, no non-compete for longer than one year. Uh, geographic scope has to be limited to where the employee had influence. We play a lot of games with this. We say they have influence all over the country. We do a lot of stuff like this. It's See, kosher, we don't know. There's not a lot of cases out there on the statute, on the intricacies of the statute yet. It's brand new. Um, so employers have to, they have a choice. They either offer paid garden leave or other some other mutually agreed upon consideration, which must be specified. So you can say, I'm giving you $10,000 bonus for this non-compete. Uh, is that enough? I don't know. We haven't figured that out. I haven't been litigated. Uh, <laughs> but in general, and garden leave is 50% of the employee's salary for the non-compete period. So if it's one year, it's the equivalent of six months of pay. Um, we write these things in very creative ways where we will say we might it might be a year, we could reduce it to six months. We could do whatever we want. We can waive it. We could choose when you're leaving to say, never mind on the non-compete, so we don't have to pay you a dime. <laughs> That's what most of my clients do. I haven't had a single client pay out cardinally. And it's been four years. So what should you do? I, I'm in this position right now. Yeah. Um the after I left the company, I sold my company to them, and I had to sign a garden leave as part of my employment agreement. When when that kicks in over and above the other agreement, the, the corporate deal, yeah, that one makes more sense. Yeah, so that yeah. one's totally. But, that, but the other yeah, yeah. the other one's coming up. What do I do when that date occurs? Do I call them up and say, "Hey, that now we're into the garden leave portion of it"? They should be paying you if they want to enforce it. But should I make a request? Like, what do you do? Like, because because you like, let's say I want to go get a job working yes. for a competitor. Don't I kind of want to know in advance whether they're going to enforce that or not? See, that's the really weird thing about this. You do. They don't want to tell you because they want you to just be deterred from taking that job. Right. Because you'd rather make 100% of your pay working somewhere else than 50% of your pay when they say to you, hey, we're enforcing this. Go quit that job you just took. This is why it's a, ended up being pointless. So the way I understand <laughs> it, the way I understand it from what Scott had with you is you don't have, they don't have to enforce it until they want to enforce it. And they can wait till you, they screw up your life. And so that is why it ended up being a boondoggle for employers. 
So, well, it's actually a boondoggle for the employees. Not really, because we just waive it every single time. Well, if you want to know, but if you want to waive it, that's fine. Yeah. But they, they can choose to enforce it after the employee then go takes another job somewhere and screw their situation up and they go, ah, we'll pay you now. But they, don't right. have, they should have to tell you at the point you leave, we're either going to enforce it or not enforce it and be done. So technically they're supposed to at the time okay. you leave. But at the time you leave, you, you have a job or you don't have a job. You, well, you don't. So most so people don't. are leaving company A to go to company B. So most people, you've already made that calculation before we've told you whether we're waiving it or not. That's where it kind of is a trap. Okay. Most people don't just leave and do nothing. So that's in that situation, you have more power than the employer, but that's pretty unusual. Yeah. I mean, if some people if some just say, I'm, I'm quitting, I'm leaving, they don't yeah. have another job, and then they're going to go look for another job. They, they should, I think they deserve to know what, yes, where, what actually, they're allowed to do. So, what I have one client that's very good about it, it has a form attached to it, and they, every single time someone leaves, they go, We're waiving it, we're waving okay. it. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's what a good employer And if they don't waive it, they then have to start paying garden leave. Right. Theoretically, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just so you I guarantee you, they will. You're about to start working for your for their main competitor. Yeah. And you know, if you don't want me to do this, then give me the money. And but then they might waive it anyway. Right. So just fine. Well, then, then, but then, then, then you know what you said. No, you said I would know. Yeah. 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 So if you call their bluff. I once said one of my clients wanted me to write the agreement in such a way that. And this is rare for me to do that. I actually have to send an email, which I call a cover your ass email, where I say this is not enforceable, right? Like just to be clear, I'm writing this the way you want me to, but I will not stand up in court for this. <laughs> um, and I said to him, you've pushed the, I, I, you know, have your cake and eat it too concept so far that I can't, eat. like, it was like the person had to disclose where they were going the first, like before it was like a whole list of things. And it was just, he pushed the envelope on this um, way past what the statute intended. <laughs> But is that a problem? No, in the grand scheme of things, he can do that because he's using it as deterrence. He's not actually planning on, on using it. No, uh, this is the, the problem with non-competes. They're tools now. They're not actually being enforced in large part. It's just a manipulative thing. And, you know, so do with that what you will. I have clients that love their non-competes. I am a big fan of non-solicits. Um, we were talking before um, at lunch about the fact that I'm a big fan of tiering them. So maybe you have four executives that are on non-competes. Everyone else is on a non-solicit or lower. Like they can have just a confidentiality agreement for some. Because you don't need this on most people. Most people are not going to be a problem. They really have to be someone who could hurt, hurt, hurt you. And for those people, you should be willing to pay. Right? And, th and this one is really for the people who signed an agreement. After. Yes. After 2018. Exactly. They, this is the first time the state of Massachusetts did not go backwards. <laughs> it is a forward thinking on it. Yeah. And that's actually why we don't have very much law on it, because almost everything we've been litigating in the last four years predated the 2018, right? Uh, it takes a while for people to care enough about an employee <laughs> to want to enforce the non compete Yeah, Got it. I think that's why we're having this weird lag. Of, there's like two decisions and they're both like not helpful at all. Um, so there's lots of drafting sorry, traps. Can, they, can yep. they consult rather than go work for an employer? So they say- uh, Oh, we write it in a way they can't do anything. Sorry. We write it in a way that they can't even walk in the front door. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we lawyers are good at that stuff. <laughs> um, so there's lots of drafting traps too. So you just give putting garden leave isn't enough. You have to give them 10 days before their start date to look at the document. Both parties have to sign it. This is another trick. Sometimes my client forgets to sign their half of it. Um, you have to tell them to talk to an attorney. It has to be in the agreement. Must protect statutory protected interests such as trade secrets. They have, you have to have something high level and then cover this reasonable geographic scope. You need to talk about that. So you need, there's certain language that we all use um, that you have to have in there. Um, like I said, it's not retroactive. You can still have those non-solicits confidentialities. Um, and and we, it's a concept called blue penciling. Um, blue penciling is the ability for the court to reform it if you overstepped. Um, some states don't allow blue penciling, Massachusetts still does, which we were surprised. We thought they were going to take that away from us. That again allows employers to have an agreement that is facially unenforceable. <laughs> Go to court to enforce it and have the court just drop it down to another level. You try that in North Carolina, North Carolina will throw the whole thing out, right? oh. which is actually very dangerous. That, that causes employers to write very conservative, fair agreements because otherwise they'll lose the confidentiality, they'll lose the non right? They'll lose the other stuff that they want. So, um, but Mass kept that. So other non-compete pitfalls. Um, prior to the statute actually going to effect, we were still a kind of a cute state. 
we have this concept called, um, uh, it's from Bartlett Tree, which is the name of the case law. And basically it was, if you gave somebody a raise, promotion, change their um, commission, you know, numbers or their territory, um, and you didn't reaffirm that non-compete, it washed away. So every single time, so we we joke that management side lawyer, the only time we swing both ways, so to speak, um, is non-compete. So one day we're trying to help our clients steal the employee, and the next day we're fighting with each other over the taking of the employee. Right? We can go, we'll argue both sides of our mouth on this one. So we'll just look at each other and be like Bartlett Tree, and they'll be like, I don't think Bartlett Tree. Like, like, <laughs> He got a raise. Oh, I don't think that was enough. Like, this is the kind of thing that we're we're going to fight with each other about a lot. So what do my good clients do? Two things. One, in their agreement, it says any changes to your compensation, job title, whatever, do not enforce the enforceability, do not affect the enforceability of this agreement. Is that enough? We don't know. No one's ever tested it in court. <laughs> we just put it in there in the hopes that it works, right? Wait till the court case. And we've been, I've been doing this for over a decade. So I don't know when that's going to get tested. Second thing we do. Every time you give someone a promotion, a pay increase, a demotion, you make them re-sign an affirmation that they are still under this agreement. Whoa. That is what the good clients do. Half my clients, like when I go through a RIF, I'm doing one on Tuesday. I said to the client, I need all the, the confidentiality agreements. I need all of these and the non-competes. Okay, sure. I said, you're going to find that five of them are missing. <laughs> like, no, 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 we do it. Inevitably, you will find <laughs> there are some missing. What, what are the ramifications to say, for instance, you give someone an increase, uh -huh. all right, and you didn't actually have that uh, reference back to existing terms and conditions? Yep, it's uh, gone. So none of that would be honest. And the non solicit goes too. Just non non, non compete and non solicitation without the rest of the confidentiality. The rest is. It's just where you're close to. This is every, all, from now, that case is from the 60s. We've been doing this game for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it got broader. It used to be that it had to be a harm to your pay, right? That makes more sense. You demoted the person, right? Now it's any pay so raises. Every in our annual cycle when we're doing from like these raises, we have to go through this awful process. It's not an awful process because you just have them sign an acknowledgement. Just By the way, you should always tell people what their new pay rate is and their new job title is in writing. So you're just adding it to that form. So, okay. so you everything know. else just remains in place, basically. Yeah. You know how much of my job is just getting an HR person to, to check a box? It's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and, and it. Look, I love my HR people more than anything. Like they are why I exist and, and they're the joy of my day because I enjoy them with people. Little tiny administrative errors cause other things, right? Like I, I had a um, client come to me and be like, "We didn't get a signed agreement. Can we still send them a cease and desist?" And I'm like, "What do you want me to cease and desist him from doing? Like, I he has no agreement. Well, what if we just reference the thing that we're pretty sure he signed and just can't find it? No. <laughs> I mean, I can come up with like duty of loyalty, fiduciary duty. I can." I can write a cease and desist of some sort, but I'm not going to source a contract that you can't find the document without a signature on it. Like that's that's going to get me in serious trouble with the bar. So, um, and just always remember, you walk into court to enforce a non-compete, that judge hates you every single time. So I have to, I know when I go in there, I am on the wrong side and I have to be right. So I have to have really good paperwork. Why is that? They don't like telling humans that they can't work. It's a company versus a person. They don't think of it as two companies. The more I can make it about two companies, the better. But a human versus a company, the human is always going to be the status hat. And, and they're equity cases, not law cases, which is a little bit of a weird concept, but there's a fairness component to it. I really like this thing because it really increases my faith in the judicial system. Really? Because yeah. I have none. <laughs> <laughs> out of this trial going the dumbest way to solve our problems <laughs> and i always say it's because my mother's a mediator that i'm even more so skeptical I, of this is how we solve our problems I, in america no I, I meant the part about the judges like you know yes. needing to put people out of work i think that part i said that part is good yes. except for the one little part of like if we appeal we usually win oh. but my <laughs> client has to want to enforce that money like so going to court to enforce a non-compete when you come to me and say Samantha, I want to enforce this non-compete. I am so mad at this person. They have really upset me. They are going to a competitor. I, you, we have to go to court. And I go, okay, fine. There are two reasons to enforce a non-compete. One, vengeance. Fine. That is it. That is it. That's your way. Fine. Two, there's a bunch of other people and you want to teach them a lesson. We're worried that they're going to go too. 
Otherwise, you can also just make a direct donation to my kid's child fund, college fund, okay? <laughs> because you're not going to make any money off of this transaction, except in very rare situations where we're also bringing in the other employer, right? Or like I had a non-solicit case. I'll give you, this is the perfect example. I had a non-solicit case. He completely violated the non-solicit. Took, he had four clients. He stole all four of them. Picture perfect. We go into court. I'm standing in front of a female judge. She and I are the only women in the courtroom. Other guy comes in. You, you often get surprised because not many cases go very fit So you don't see their paperwork until they come to, they see my paperwork, but I don't see their paperwork until they come into court. This guy comes in and says, president of the company was sexually harassing this employee's wife. Totally took me by surprise. We were at the height of the Me Too movement. I said, your honor, that's not an excuse for, for soliciting customers. Like he could just quit and then, you know, sue, but he doesn't get to steal the customers. And she goes, I'm very concerned about this. I, I just, I can't do the, I can't do the pre-I, I, you know, and she, she didn't give it to me. So we litigated for three years, okay, against a, a human who owed his lawyer at the end of the day, a quarter of a million dollars. We won a million dollars in summary judgment against him. Ask me how much we won. 10,000. Wow. So what did the client pay for that? <laughs> did they, was that a good victory? All the lawyers, I, I was, it was ridiculous, right? And, and I had told the client beforehand, don't do this, do not do this. But he wanted vengeance. I mean, your point up there about non compete, you know, what are your reasons for it? Yeah. If, your, re if your, your main reason is really to find out where the person's going so you have some time to get your act together, how do you do that without a non compete? Like a like good old fashioned. Conversation or something. What do you mean? How do you know what? Like, I think a lot of times. Well, we put, we put. Oh, we put in the agreement. You have to tell us where you go to work. Well, but people don't like to sign non-competes. I understand. Yes. I mean, it creates a smart person of, negotiates at the front. Yeah, it, it it frustrates employees and whatever. Yes. But how do you, how how do you protect your business interests when people leave that have. That, you know, compete against you or take your client. You not know, yeah, not solicits, confidentiality, IP. I mean, theoretically, if people are honest and abide by them, your IP agreement and your and your confidentiality agreement should protect you. But you have to trust that they're actually going to do that. So, so oftentimes we do reminder letters. Sometimes like those, just the reminder you signed this. You should always remind people when they're walking out the door about what they signed. Playing hide the ball. Like I was reading someone's agreement the other day and it said, if you signed a, a non-compete confidentiality agreement, you remain under those terms. If, did I? Did I they don't remember 10 years later. Like <laughs> you need to throw it. I attach it to all my separation agreements. It could be that, right? Because that that's what it's good for. And then you say to them, if you took any confidential information to return it to us, this should all be said to them when they're walking out the door. That's like HR practice. Um so do you need a non-compete? Um, please think long and hard about it. Consider using the tiers. Don't, not every employee is the same. And if there's a national ban, don't, don't worry about it too much. But do remember there's oddities in the states, right? Obviously we all know California, Oklahoma, North Dakota, you can't have them at all. Severely restrict them, Massachusetts, Washington, and Colorado. Many ban the low wage workers, Illinois, Virginia. It just, every time that became a trend for a while was doing these, especially the low wage workers, um, which I hope you were never doing before anyways, just be careful because some states have very specific, like Washington state, we have very specific language that literally has to be in the document. If it's not in the document, it doesn't work. And that's a trick so that when you go to court, you're just dead on arrival. That's, and, and look, kudos to Washington, they're protecting their people, right? I, I actually have a, Decent an admiration for states that are, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So this is my quick little summary on documentation. Who cares about it? We do. We, we really want you to document things. <laughs> Very important to us. The MCAD would like to see it, and the courts and the juries are, would like to see it too. Why? Because these documents, hiring documents, performance documents, investigation documents, terms and conditions of employment, communications, what do they do? They document a time, period. Memories go away. So. If you don't write it down, it didn't happen. You're, even if your memory is awesome, documents don't lose their memory, change jobs, retire to Florida, fall apart on the witness stand. They exist. They are the most powerful thing we have as lawyers. 
when I can give that to opposing counsel, they often go away. And it's just true that if we see something written at the time, we tend to believe it's true, right? I'm not telling you to put things and write down things that didn't happen, but you understand that that's a very powerful thing with a jury. What does that mean that I want you to do? It means that I want you to tell employees the truth on feedback, give this regular feedback, particularly performance reviews. How many times do I get a request for a personnel record, which obviously in most states you have the right to see your personnel record, and I have nothing to give, absolutely nothing like maybe a couple of higher documents, but it doesn't look good. I have to tell, I got to tell this client that she's now my poster child. We got a request for a personnel file. She gave me a stack of documents this high with warnings in it. I gave it to opposing counsel. We never heard from them again, right? She deserves a gold star <laughs> because there was enough documentation that that lawyer just was like, it's not even worth it. I'm not even going to bother. You know, there's too much here. Because when that plaintiff goes into that lawyer's office, do you think they tell the truth? No. Yeah, sure. Maybe they tell what they think is the truth, but it isn't both sides of the story. There's always two sides to every story. And a very smart plaintiff's lawyer once said to me, the best day in any one of my cases is the first day they walk into my office. From that moment, it goes steadily down <laughs> every single day, right? Because they haven't talked to us yet. Like I had a lovely conversation with an opposing counsel this week. This was the smoke break one. Um, he was very nice. He didn't know any of the stuff I was saying. And so he thanked me at the end and he said, let me get back to you because I think these, these people are better off separated anyways. <laughs> and I agree with him. And I think my client is willing to pay a small amount to get rid of this human being so they never have to deal with her again. But that's the thing, right? We're not going to pay her a million dollars. Um, and that's what I was trying. I try to set expectations when I talk to opposing counsel because we had a lot of paperwork on her. In, in terms of um, performance reviews, we do them, we have them, they're not in the personnel files. Do we need to put them in there or do we need to put them? When somebody asks for it, they are. So even if it's not, you know, they're in another system. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when they ask for it, personal record is defined under the statute in Massachusetts, 52C. So it includes anything that could affect their employment. So it's performance reviews, it's warnings, it's, um, you know, any any paperwork about their hire, their fire, it's all yeah. of that stuff. Technically, it's covered. I never give them unless they're useful to me. Okay. So I, company, I actually had a company that I worked with who didn't do performance reviews. A lot of them don't. And, and it was always received as a benefit to the employer to not do them. I know. I don't yeah, disagree. I don't. Maybe I because disagree. they're lazy and it takes time. Well, it <laughs> sounds like they're leaving themselves vulnerable to litigation. Yeah. I mean, oh, so maybe I have a client for you. <laughs> so I know. So talk to my clients. Will say to me, "Oh, we're just a family business, and you know, everyone gets long hair." And I'm like, "Okay, until somebody sues you, that's that's a no." This place has like 150 employees. Mm. Yeah, that's probably. I like honestly, it's for you. You're not helping the employee. Um, that said, they have to be truthful, right? So, what the biggest prob problem we have, you know, I. I have friends and family who do this. The scale is one to five, hypothetically, right? Now, we, we don't do that as much nowadays. We're, we're a little bit more touchy feely, orange music templates, but you give a person a three, meets expectations. You want me to now argue that that's not meets expectations? You want me to, you want to send me to court and to the MCAD with like, well, like a, a C is actually a failing grade in our company. <laughs> not everyone to get a B or an A. No, if they're a D, they're a D. You got to give them the twos. And it's really hard to do that. And so that's where we struggle with performance reviews is mm -hmm. that so many people don't wanna be mean, they wanna encourage. And so having those harsh number systems actually can backfire on us. It is better to just do comments. Like, I need you to work on this. I need you to work on that. Like if you're not, unless you're talking about a real blue collar environment, the one to five scale can be problematic. That's, what about if you do like peer reviews? So for instance, you know, as part of your process. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, any any sort of paperwork I have, I have one client, really great client, does these things called touch points. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to really invest to do this kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. the manager and the employee will meet like once a month, and they it's a dialogue on paper between the two of them. The employee saying what they need, the the manager saying what they need, and it becomes this sort of huge volume of what's going on in the relationship mm -hmm. that I can then mine for information. <laughs> when it's done well, when the managers are trained and they do it. Constructively. Yeah, and I don't say you, I'm not saying you have to be mean, but you have to say, I need you to come to work on time if you need them to come to work on time. Like you, you, you do have to tell them on the things they're doing wrong. 
So we want these reviews or documents or warnings or whatever performance improvement plans. Um, don't make a promise you can't or won't keep, right? Um, they have to be accurate, right? Um, create the impression the decision was tainted by unlawful bias. So just be careful. Have two people read the thing. You don't want to say things like your performance was much better before you had the baby. <laughs> be surprised how many people kind of do that a little bit or like really slow down since you took that leave of absence, that kind of stuff. It's usually disability that we find it most obviously written. Um, not clearly written, not doesn't have a good timeline in it. It's mean, right? You don't want to do those. But um, so we already covered some of this. Let's see. Boy, it doesn't know. Yeah. So we want them to know that they're struggling. It's not a hide the ball situation. If you don't think they're doing well, you need to tell them. And one of the things is employers, employees often know that they're starting to fail, right? Because maybe in an email or in something you seem frustrated or you're not getting them as much work. Sometimes they then go out on a leave of absence before you do this which is why you have to do it because then I'm in that bubble and you see how that cycle can, can get work. Um, it, like we had an employee <laughs> sent an email saying, this horrible email saying, I know I'm going to get fired for this email and then promptly went on leave. Um, and now he's doing us at the end stage. So is, is that okay? And we had every right to fire because <laughs> he admitted in the email that the email was so bad that he should be fired. So there are a lot of weird things going on with PFML um, and we still have to deal with the fallout from it. Um, insistent, inconsistently applied standards. If you, your current employees that are doing well actually want you to write up the person not doing well, right? It's to their benefit. You're actually harming them a lot. Um, lack standards create problems for the managers try to enforce them, and it's not fair to the rest of the team to allow poor performance to go unaddressed. Let's see, we'll skip over some of this. Uh, and you'll give us the slides as well, right? I'm sorry? You'll give us the slides. Yes, I will. So if I skip things and go faster, it's just me trying to get through here. Basically, I want a timeline. And the reason I want a timeline is because you're going to forget. And I don't want you to sugarcoat, right? I want you to tell the truth, not meanly, not fully. I just want you to tell the truth. But I do want this to be, hey, remember last month when I, this is a great way to get your verbal stuff down on paper. When I talked to you on October 15th, when I talked to you on November 15th, when I talked to you on December 15th, these are the things I said to you then. Maybe you forgot to send the follow-up email that I'd like you always send after you do your verbals. So when you do your verbals, I want to be like, as we discussed this morning, going forward, boom, like that's what I want to see. Because then I have a lovely pile. <laughs> then I have the written, and then I have the performance improvement plan. Do I need you to do progressive discipline? No, if someone's really bad, we will fire them. I promise you, right out of the gate. What about so say you're at a tip and like with our tips, what will happen? We'll go in the last and sign it. Yes. If they like not they like not so if they come back and say like the sign that. Then that's a sign that you're going in the right direction of that person, right? <laughs> um, it should say acknowledged, not agree to. Mm -hmm. You can even give them a place where they can write their own feedback. Right. In right. fact, do, yeah. in Massachusetts, they're allowed to put anything they want in their own personnel file, mm -hmm. query what the point of that is, but that is the law. Um, if you have an employee like that, I think you will express to them verbally, I'm disappointed that you're not <laughs> taking this seriously. And I think that's probably a harbinger that this pit may not go well, right? right? Um, I would have that sort of dialogue with them. Is there something you disagree in here? Let's talk about it. And if they still refuse to do it, I guarantee you that employee is going to end up fired. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. it's because they're not accepting Sure. responsibility and a pitch should always be from the perspective of you've got this you know tiger you can do it <laughs> um even though we know they can't oh i lost my connection oh there we go i got one um at least i have it on one screen okay we'll read it from here um so remember we talked about handbooks uh let's do this guys this keeps happening as we drag Okay, so don't impose arbitrary time limit discipline, things like that, but say something like, you know, in three weeks, in three months, everything goes away. Don't do anything like that. Don't you, the PIP is for the rest of their lives, literally, right? I can come back to it later if I want. If they can't do something, we're going to still do that. Don't restrict your disciplinary options. You want to say further violations up to and including termination, you need to include that kind of language. Um, common mistake is to let disciplinary, you know, keep documenting. Don't wait until you want them fired that day to do something. We know that this happens, tends to happen around the holidays, but 
please, mm -hmm. every time this person frustrates you, it's part of your job as a manager, and this is what you're going to train your managers. They are required to do this. This is part of being a manager is to document the problems. Failure to do that is not being a good manager. What's, what about situations where it kind of escalates before you're really like there's a little here and a little here and, a little and here. they just want to fire them and then and then you're like oh no this really is a problem so sometimes we do just have to fire people right we do it it's reality right some people it's they're just this isn't the right job for them or they're just incapable of doing it in that situation that might be an immediate pip or a final warning right and you would document the two prior incidents but it, it really does it's somewhat fact specific um you don't want to look like you're papering a file, but you do want to paper a file. <laughs> Get my grip. So it shouldn't be just like, it should be specific to the actual incidents. So uh, in our situation, managers don't have access to their personnel files. Only operation okay. HR has. So how does... The manager should not be doing anything on their own. Everything should be through HR. Right. So... Okay. So the manager needs to go to HR and say, I, yeah, I want to go to a, you go to HR and say, I want to do a warning. And then HR helps them draft it. Because if you want to know when we get the really bad warnings, it's when the managers do it without any oversight. That's when we get things like, oh, all you're doing is talking to your kid on the phone. You know, that's, I don't want to see that in the, in the review. Um, if someone's struggling, keep documenting it. Keep documenting it. Keep going. Um, consider these verbal warnings with documentations, like I said, the email follow-up. Private notes to yourself are not enough, but honestly, and they're legally problematic in Massachusetts, you're required to put things in people's personnel files within 10 days of you um, doing it. The, the punishment for that is is rather, there's no private right of action. It's not, you know, you can threaten me all you want with it. There's not really not much you can do about it, but try to avoid it if possible. Um, let's see. Lack of detail, over documentation, under documentation, lack of consistency. You'll see this. Um, so the best way to get sued is to fail to document these things. You know, not to give annual performance reviews, not to document mistakes. Employees are not going to agree they deserve to be fired at the end of the day. I mean, look, maybe one or two a year, but like the vast majority think they're awesome, um, or that you're unfair. And discipline managers who fail to to discipline. I mean, I say that a lot. Um, my HR people will tell you that that is a common phrase out of my mouth, that this is the manager's fault, the manager caused it. And we probably won't have time for the um, fact discuss the problem sets that I gave you guys, but you'll see that that's a common theme in there is that the manager is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, not the full problem, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but they are part of the problem and they are certainly not part of the solution. And that's something that we wanna see. We're going to see plaintiff's lawyers that are going to tell us all the time that they repeatedly complained, that the employee repeatedly complained and the manager did nothing. So they didn't go to the right person. That's why your person has to know how to go to the right person for them. So when they come to them and say, hey, I don't want you to do anything about this, but you now Bob over here keeps sexually harassing me. But I don't want you to do anything about it. And the manager's like, well, okay, I'm not going to do anything about it. No, no, wrong answer. If you don't know what to do, go to HR and ask. But the right answer is, I care about you as an employee. And because of that, you and I are going to go walk over to HR and talk to them about this situation. I think you should just as for instance, when one employee says, hey, I'm not being happy to another employee. If you um, overhear it, you should deal with it. Or uh, the, well, say it's not overheard, but then the other employee who was the recipient of these information surfaces that and then I thought it was told to me in confidence. Unhappy, I don't know that I would do anything with it. If it was a harassment situation or an illegal conduct or anything about disability, I think I, I would then have HR pull that, that makes side. Sense, yeah. yeah. Sure. And it's and, and you say you're doing it out of caring about them. Yeah. Which is true. You are. Like I if we're in a situation so the standard for sexual harassment, if it's a manager that's doing the harassment, it's it's um strict liability. There's I can't get out from under it. Like the moment it happens, we're strictly liable for it. Doesn't mean that we can't do things to mitigate the, the damages and the, and the harm that we're going to get in trouble for. But if, a, if it's two employees, it's newer should have known. So if you know, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's where it becomes problematic. And when I said unhappy, I mean like they're unhappy with their job and they feel to be kind of compensated inappropriately and stuff like that. Well, and stuff. that being compensated inappropriately is concerted that is a concerted activity complaint. So again, some of this stuff is nuanced and hard to right. sort of do off the top of my head, but it's the kind of thing you want to find out what it is, what's going on, and should we 
we could also just do a check-in with the employee. Hey, we're checking in with everyone under right. this particular manager. Maybe you're concerned that this manager is a problem. Right. So you want to just do an employee check-in and you send HR around yeah. to do that. So I know I ran my mouth a bit over. <laughs> but it's not my fault. It was all the good questions. Right? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> but these problems, if you want to like go through them just for your own application, they're, they're what I call fun things to talk about. There is no answer. There's no like, you know, circle B and you're right. <laughs> Uh, only, only, only a lawyer would say these are fun things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my job is fun because humans are fun. I know. Well, there you go. What uh, one man's problem is another man's. Uh, yeah. Do you remember Conan O'Brien used to have stupid pet tricks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do stupid human tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Maybe Letterman. Yeah, I think Letterman did yeah. stupid human yeah. tricks too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, thank you, thank you, Samantha. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I feel like I feel like drinking from a fire hose and I learned a lot, but probably only 10% of, the, of what you said. So there's a lot there. And uh, I have some other questions that I, I'm not still here. Oh, oh, if you guys have any questions that I didn't answer or thought, you know, let me know. But do sign, put your name there if you, or pull up a business card and yeah, put you on the sure. mailing list because, you know, at the very least, we'll tell you what the FTC does. Um, you know, we're. We get these little newsletters out as much as we can. That's great, though. Really, really nice yeah. job. Thank you. Yeah, I'll tell you a quick snack. I like it because I am born and bred here, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though I lived in California for a while. Oh, well, it did roll off. Oh, it did. Oh, did I don't love non compete. That's hard. <laughs> Although I do, well, let me rephrase that. I don't love to him, though. Yeah. All right, though. How about question for you? Oh, it's not a necessarily good question. Like, long time ago, I had an employee tell me my office. I wonder if that's true. He said, I did a job I had to buy for, they didn't get it as a reporter. And I don't get it, and it has, you know, they say, she said, because we can want to get a job when we can still go. But I heard back chatter. People say, So she came to me and said, yeah, you know, Thanks very much. Have a great day. Well, I mean, I've you once. I've been on the app now in trouble. It's in the days. 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 It's in the